the forces of darkness and not against flesh and blood. We're standing firm against the schemes of the devil and taking up our shield of faith. Yeah, I wanna be an invisible hero. I wanna be his faithful soldier. I wanna be an invisible hero. I wanna be his faithful soldier. It's time, my friend, to put on. The sword of the spirit These are our weapons of war Yeah I wanna be An invisible hero I wanna be His faithful soldier I wanna be An invisible hero I wanna be His faithful soldier And pray at all times Keep alert And be fair with Uh, this is called New Song. Hold on. This is driving me crazy. Hold on. <laughs> it will not stay. Here we go. Let's see if I can do it. Wait on patiently for the Lord, expectantly for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me out from the darkest pit, out from the miry clay. Set my weary feet upon a rock. He's now steady in my footsteps, establishing my ways. He's given me a sweet new song. I will say. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his refuge And will not turn his head to hear the proud So many are his wonders, so beautiful his ways No one can compare with you Oh, if I should declare your words, if I should speak of them They're just too many to be numbered I will say Song. I will sing, I sing a new song. He's given me a sweet new song. In sacrifice and offering, you don't desire. 
desire Nor do you delight in them You give capacity to hear And obey My ears are too small, that's part of my problem. <laughs> just, this thing is just not working yet for me. Okay. Get comfortable, I don't have to think about that. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, if you could turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, and you should have my translation of Daniel chapter 11 in front of you. Uh, we're going to be noting verse 15, the prophecy of verse 15, which has uh, a prophecy of Antiochus III, who we've been talking about for the last couple of verses. It's a prophecy in verse 15 of uh, Antiochus III capturing Sidon. Uh, which was a fortified city of the Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, Empire. So this prophecy of Antiochus III is about him capturing Sidon by defeating the Egyptian commander Scopus, who I mentioned last evening a little bit toward the uh, end of the class. So we'll be noting that verse here this evening, Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 15. So without uh, further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to uh, listen to what the Holy Spirit will speak to us through the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, this requires us to be in fellowship with God to understand what He's being, uh, what He's saying to us. Uh, and we don't want it just to be academic information. The Bible is, uh, when it's taught with the filling of the Spirit, uh, is a spiritual phenomena and can only be understood while we're in fellowship with the Holy Spirit with His help. So uh, we confess our sins. We do what 1 John 1, 9 states. That restores the filling of the Spirit and our fellowship with God, and, and which are maintained, of course, by obedience, bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time to gather together with other members of the body of Christ, like-minded believers who are serious about your word. We thank you for everyone that is here this evening. 
and the Thompson household, and those who might be viewing or listening this class through the website or Pal Talk. Uh, we thank you, Father, for Titus and Jody Thompson's great hospitality on opening up their home to us and their sacrifice. We also uh, thank you for uh, revealing yourself to us through this, the, the pages of Scripture. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who makes your word real and understandable to us, and we pray that he would guide us and direct us in our studies here this evening. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and sending him to the cross when we were yet your enemies, and raising him from the dead, and seating him at your right hand, and then through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, appropriating that victory that your son uh, accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. Help us to see the great power and love that has been directed toward us. Help us to always remember what you've done for us in delivering us from eternal condemnation and giving us the forgiveness of sins and deliverance from the condemnation from the law and the sin nature and the devil and his cosmic system. Help us to always look back at in the past of what you've done for us, Father, so that we could be motivated and inspired to walk by faith in the present moment and in the future. We thank you for the fulfilled prophecies that we've been studying in the book of Daniel, in our study of Daniel chapter 11. And we just pray, Father, that you would, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, continue to guide us and direct us in this study that we're presently engaged in. We pray that you would help me as the communicator, to, communicator this evening to communicate your word with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power. Uh, help me to be your instrument this evening. Help me to be sensitive and humble, uh, sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction and uh, so that I could fulfill the purpose for which you gave me the gift of teaching. We pray, Father, for the audience that you would help them to understand also to the ministry of the Spirit, help them as well to be sensitive to his Spirit's guidance and direction, and to be humble as well. We pray, Father, that they would be built up and edify the audience, and this, the Word of God would uh, take root in their souls and would bear fruit in their lives, the character of Christ. We pray that this class also would bring glory and honor to you and bring praise to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for these people and things. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Uh, we're going to start at uh, verse 2, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. We're going to read all the way through uh, verse 15, uh, our subject here this evening. And I'm not going to uh, uh, review uh, what we've covered thus far. I've gone over that uh, the, the, the more, as we go into this class toward the later end, end of the class or as we get into the class. I'll, I'll be mentioning uh, those verses that are related to verse 15. Uh, this evening, the previous couple of verses, but other than that, I'm not going to go into uh, uh, summarize or go into review uh, what we've already covered in the first uh, 12 verses at least. So uh, it says in verse 2, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, and I'm, I'm uh, reading from my translation. It says, now at this present time, I must reveal to you the truth. Behold, three future kings will ascend to power for Persia. Then the fourth will cause greater riches to make him wealthier than each and every one of these in comparison. However, when he amasses power through his wealth, the entire nation will stir up the Greek kingdom. Next, the powerful king will ascend to power so that he will rule with great authority with the result that he will do according to his desire. However, after he ascends to power, his kingdom will be broken up. Then it will be divided towards the heavens four winds, but not for the benefit of his posterity, and in addition, not according to his sovereign will, which he sovereignly exercised. For his kingdom will be uprooted, specifically for the benefit of others, to the separation and exclusion of these. Then the king ruling the south, as well as the, one of his subordinate commanders, will be strong. In fact, he will become stronger than him, because he will exercise authority over a dominion greater than his dominion. Next, at the end of an unspecified number of years, they will form an alliance as the daughter of the king ruling the south will enter into marriage with the king ruling the north in order to secure a peaceful arrangement. However, she will by no means retain her powerful position. Likewise, he will by no means endure, namely his power. For she will be delivered over as well as he who caused her to end into marriage, as well as her child, and in addition her benefactor during those times. But one of the branches from her roots will ascend to power in his place. Then he will wage an attack against their army so that he will enter the fortress of the king ruling the north. Indeed, he will take action against them so that he will be victorious. Consequently, he will cause their gods to be transported into captivity to Egypt along with their cast images as well as their valuable silver and gold articles. Furthermore, for some years, he will withdraw from the king ruling the north. Then he will wage an attack against the king ruling the south but will return to his land. 
Verse 10, following this, his sons will initiate hostile military action. Specifically, they will muster a multitude of great military forces. Then he will, as a certainty, wage a massive attack so that they will overflow, yes, pass through like a flood, with the result that he will turn him back. Indeed, he will engage in hostile military action up to his fortress. Then the king ruling the south will cause himself to be enraged so that he will march out in order to wage war against him, against the king ruling the north. Consequently, he will cause a great multitude to be assembled. However, despite this, this multitude will be delivered into his power. When this multitude will be defeated, his heart will become arrogant. Even though he will cause 10,000 to fall in combat, he will by no means continue to prevail. For he will return again, since he will muster a, a multitude larger than the first in order to wage a massive attack with a great army, as well as enormous logistical provision at the end of an interval of some years, speaking of the king of the north. Verse 14, in fact, during those days, certain great ones will oppose the king ruling the south, even violent persons belonging to your people, Daniel, for, for uh, so it says, even violent persons belonging to your people will, for their be own benefit, rebel in order to fulfill the revelation, but they will be overthrown. Then it says in verse 15, our, our subject here this evening, and so the king ruling the north will wage an attack. Specifically, he will construct a siege mound in order to capture a fortified city. However, the, the south's armed forces will by no means stand their ground not even their elite unit, because there will be no strength. Now, up to this verse, all of this has been fulfilled in history, as I've been pointing out. In fact, as i also been pointing out in previous classes, uh, verses 2 through 35 have all been fulfilled in history. They cover a, cover a period from the 6th century B.C., uh, all the way to once, uh, the uh, second century BC with Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now, the king of the south and the king of the north, remember, uh, these are not just two kings. They're descendants of Ptolemy and Seleucus. Remember, two of Alexander's generals, who, uh, two of the four generals that, uh, they were two of the two, four generals that divided up Alexander's empire after his death, which is prophesied in verse 4 of this chapter, as we pointed out. So we have Seleucus and Ptolemy. Ptolemy had Egypt. Seleucus Lucas had Syria as his base. And so the king of the north throughout verses 2 through 35 is speaking of Syria because geographically they're north of Israel. And Egypt is the king of the south here. And we're talking about the king of the south and the king of the north. It's speaking of the descendants of Ptolemy, the king of the south, and the king of the north, Seleucus. It's talking about the descendants of these two uh, uh, generals of Alexander the Great. We've noted that in the past. When we get to verses 36 through 45, to the end of the chapter, we're talking about the, 70, uh, the, uh, the 70th week of Daniel in particular, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, when we get to those verses, and that ver those verses are speaking of the activities of Antichrist uh, during the, tr the, the final three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. So that will be an interesting, interesting class. So that's all yet future uh, in history. There's nothing in verses 36 through 45, there's nothing in history that would correspond to what's predicted in those verses. However, we look at history and we can see verses 2 through 35, uh, we have uh, uh, things being fulfilled in history. Uh, uh, this, these verses, verses 2 through 35, have been filled in, fulfilled in history when we look at history, uh, stretching from uh, the four Persian rulers that followed Cyrus the Persian all the way to Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. So this is an astounding prophecy, as we've been pointing out. It's telling us a lot about the character and nature of God, as we've been pointing out as well, That's the sovereignty of God, the wisdom of God, uh, the omniscience of God, and the, uh, the, the omnipotence of God. And all of these things are to in, uh, invoke faith in us. It's uh, it, back in Daniel's day, as we've been pointing out, it was the cause both Jew and Gentile to worship the God of Israel. And uh, it was also God's people who were already in his covenant family to walk by faith and not by sight, walk by faith in the word of God. Here in the church age, we're not, uh, uh, with, uh, we're not Israel, uh, we're a new uh, entity, the church, the bride of Christ, but it's still doing the same thing for us. It's telling us something about God and it should cause us to have faith in God's word because 
because look at the power of God's word. God's word governs the nations. God rules the world with his word. And so we also saw last evening that ultimately this should lead us to worshiping our God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we're, we're to worship by means of the Spirit and truth as we left off with Jesus teaching the woman, at, uh, Samaritan woman at the well. So uh, we can do this. Uh, when we get this information about God, this should ultimately cause us to worship him. And uh, uh, now uh, we get to, uh, we get to uh, the, the next verse, our study of this evening, verse 15. And again, we get more, fil- f- more fulfilled prophecy. So uh, if, you, uh, if, if I may, I'm going to read the New American Standards translation of Daniel 11:15, And I will also read from the Net Bible's translation of, these ver- of this verse. So in the New American Standard, verse 15 says, Then the king of the north will come, cast up a siege ramp, and capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to make a stand. Now, it says in verse uh, 15 in the the Net Bible, it says, Then the king of the north will advance and build siege mounds and capture a well-fortified city. So, the very first statement there in verse 15, then in the New American Standard, Then the king of the north will come, cast up a siege ramp, and capture a well-fortified city. That's actually not, uh, that's actually resuming the angel's thought from verse 13 uh, and not verse 14. And so verse 14 is sort of parenthetical in a way. But uh, it's connected to verse 13. Now, when he says he will come, uh, that's the word bow. We've seen it uh, quite a bit in this chapter. We, uh, we will see it quite a bit. We've seen it so far a few times. It actually means, when it says come here, it actually means to wage an attack. Uh, the Net Bible is, the, is closer to, than the, Net, uh, the New American Standard is. It's because it's talking about an, an, a, an army making an advance, but it's, or in other words, waging an attack. If you want to say advance like the Net Bible, that's not bad. But I, I, it, it actually means to wage an attack. And the reason why is because it's referring to the king of the north waging an attack by putting up siege mounds to capture a fortified city of the king of the south. So the fact that his activities here and make it clear that he's waging an attack. Now, then we have the phrase, cast up a siege ramp. That's uh, explanatory because it's defining specifically for us, excuse me, it's defining specifically the previous statement that the king ruling the north will wage an attack. It expresses the fact that the army of the king ruling the north will construct or build a siege mound in order to capture a fortified city of the king ruling the south. Now, what's a siege ramp? Excuse me. What's a siege ramp? A siege ramp refers to an elevated embankment uh, built against the defensive wall of a fortified city of the, of the king of the south. So uh, b- basically, um, I don't see if we can, uh, you, you had, in most city, uh, you know, in the ancient world, cities had walls to defend it. Obviously today, uh, walls don't do a heck of a lot of good. I mean, you get the Berlin Wall used to be around, but that was to keep the people uh, from leaving. Uh, but uh, we don't need walls for cities. Don't do anything with nu- the advent of you know uh, aerial attacks and uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't really do a, a city much g- good to have a, a wall built around it. But in the ancient world, they did that. Now, what they would do when attack was going to take place. Uh, we saw this with Babylon, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, with the Medo-Persia attacking Babylon. The walls would be uh, defended, and it would be very difficult for a, a military, an army, to go up and take a city that has a well fortified, well, uh, great fortifications. You know, uh, so what they would do is they would kind of like, you know, how you build a highway. Well, they would make a, a siege ramp. They would make kind of like building a highway up into the up over the walls to try to get to breach the walls. And so of course the people on the walls would be shooting stuff at you. But the problem with that being in a city, you better have a lot of supplies there because some armies will starve you out. That's what basically what the siege would do. And that's what actually happens here with the uh, uh, Scopus, the general for the, uh, the south, for the king of the south there. He gets starved out of, of Sidon. This is what happened to Jerusalem when the Romans attacked it 
in 70 AD, people were eating their children in the, with, inside the walls because they were starving. There was no food left. So an army would do that, but they would also, and Nebuchadnezzar did this with the city of Tyre. I think it was, it was prophesied in the book of Ezekiel. I did a study on that uh, years ago, but, um, which has been fulfilled in history. It's amazing prophecy. But he built a siege ramp, kind of like a, a building a highway up, into the, up against the walls so they could come across the walls and stuff, break down the walls. So that uh, the Romans were really good at this, and so this is the idea here with this this uh, particular uh, uh, siege ramp that we're be having mentioned here in verse 15. So a siege ramp again, it refers to an elevated embankment built against the defensive wall of a fortified city. Now, when he says it in, in capture well fortified city, if you look at verse 15 in the New American Standard again, then the king of the north will come. In other words, wage an attack. And cast up, in, in other words, cast the siege ramp and capture a well-fortified city. When it says, and capture a well-fortified city, that's a purpose clause. So instead of, and capture a well-fortified city, you could put it, you could put the phrase, for the purpose of, or in order that, or even so that, because it's this statement, capture a well-fortified city, is presenting the purpose of the king of the north constructing this siege ramp. So if you look at the, the New American Standard, then the king of the north will wage an attack. Uh, specifically, he will cast up a siege ramp in order to capture a well-fortified city. See how the flow of thought there is? See how that is? Now, why doesn't the New American Standard do that? Because it, they're not technically wrong by translating the conjunctions wa there as in. Uh, it can mean that, but they leave that up for interpretation. They, mo, lo, mo, uh, that's the only thing I can think of why they do that. Now, um, then we have the phrase, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground. Instead of, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, say, but, or however, because the reason why is this statement stands in contrast to the previous statement that the king of the north will construct a siege ramp in order to capture a well-fortified city of the king of the south. So the contrast, if you compare this statement with the previous one we just read, it would mean there's a contrast between a fortified city of the king of the south serving as a defense against the army of the king of the north and the army of the south not being able to withstand this attack. So uh, even though he's got a well-fortified city, it's not, he's not going to be able to w uh, withstand the attack, the king of the south. Then we have a, a couple of more phrases here that, to complete the verse. It says in the New American Standard, then the king of the north will come or wage an attack, specifically cast up a siege ramp in order to capture a well-fortified city. And then it says, uh, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, or we could say, but the forces of the south will not stand their ground. And then it says, not even their choicest troops. That phrase is uh, emphatic because it's advancing upon and intensifying the previous statement. And what did the previous, previous statement say? It said that the armed forces of the south will by no means stand their ground against the army led by the king of the north. So the north will not only defeat the army of the south, but this statement is saying something more. It's saying, it's going beyond that. It's saying uh, they will defeat the best troops the south can put into the field of combat. So that phrase, not even their choicest troops, is, is emphatic and it's advancing upon the previous statements. So therefore, the, it's saying that the north is not only going to defeat the South, the army of the South, but the best troops of the South will be defeated. And then lastly, we have the phrase, for there'll be no strength to make a stand. That's correctly translated because it's, it's, it's got a causal idea, uh, and thus that's the idea in the Hebrew. So this statement, for there'll be no strength to make a stand, presents the reason why the armed forces of the South and their elite combat unit will by no means stand their ground against the army led by the king of the north. Now, if you could look at verse 15, actually, if you could, look at verse 13 first. Look at verse 13 first in my translation, and we will read all the way through verse 15. We, verse 15 makes better sense if you read the other previous two verses with it, because it's connected to these verses. So look at verse 13. And forgive me for my voice, it's a little ragged here tonight, I don't know why. 
um, verse 13, it says, For he will return again, since he will muster up, he is in context, the king ruling the north. For he will return again, since he will muster a multitude larger than the first, the first army he, he used, which was defeated, in order to wage a massive attack with a great army, as well as enormous logistical provision at the end of an interval of some years. In fact, during those days, certain great ones will oppose the king ruling the south. Even violent persons belonging to your people will, for their own benefit, rebel in order to fulfill the revelation, but they will be overthrown. Verse 15. And so, the king ruling the north, the north will wage an attack. Specifically, he will construct a siege mound in order to capture a fortified city. However, the south's armed forces will by no means stand their ground, not even their elite unit, because there will be no strength. Now, verse 15, as I mentioned a few moments ago, is, review, is resuming, re picking up the thought of verse 13. And verse 13, as we read, uh, we have the angel, the elect angel of God, communicating to Daniel the reason why the king of the south will by no means continue to prevail militarily and politically over the king of the north. He tells Daniel in verse 13 that the king of the north will return once again to fight the king of the south. The reason why he says this will be the case is that the king, he'll return to fight the king of the south, the king of the north will, even though he got beat the first time. And the reason why he's coming back is that he will muster a larger army, a much larger army than the first, which was defeated by the king of the south. Now, the purpose of mustering this large army was to once again wage an attack against the king of the south. Now, this large army, as we read, will possess enormous logistical provision to fight this war with the king of the south. And then the angel informs Daniel in verse 13 at the very end that this massive attack against the king of the south by the king of the north will take place at the end of an interval of some years. Now, as we pointed out, this was fulfilled in history verse 13, because 14 years after being defeated by the king of the south, king of Egypt, uh, we see that Antiochus III, the king of the north in this verse, he came back with another army much greater and that was defeated, I mean, he was defeated the first time by Ptolemy IV Philopater in 217 BC at Raphia, very famous battles we pointed out. Well, he comes back 14 years later, Antiochus III, the king of the north, the, uh, the king of Syria, the king of the Seleucid Empire. He comes back to wage another war 14 years later after his defeat at Raphia, and he comes to fight the king of the south, the king of Egypt, who is just an infant at this, a child at this time, I shouldn't say an infant. He waged, we see that Antiochus III the Great fulfilled verse 13 when he waged a massive attack against Egypt, which was no longer under the rule of Ptolemy IV Philopater. And as I pointed out last evening, he died mysteriously in his 30s in 205 BC, and that resulted in his son, who was only four years old, coming to the throne, Ptolemy V, Epiphanes. And that was significant. As I pointed out, there are lot, some historians who uh, are wondering if, because if, we see conspiracies going uh, on later on in the, in the chapter that was successful, or the king of the south being betrayed by his own advisors. But we, there are some people who believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to believe them after reading in, about Antiochus uh, the third, the great. Uh, he was bribing people in, in the Egyptian kingdom to uh, betray the king of Egypt because they were getting their pockets lined, uh, filled, and so they were selling out their own nation. They were traitors. That shouldn't be nothing, that's nothing unusual. Uh, uh, we have it in our own country. Uh, we've had uh, people that we find out that were giving our secrets off to the Russians and the Chinese because they were, they were in debt or they were greedy and they wanted money and they were getting a lot of money. In fact, one of the things I know they do, uh, especially especially in intelligence and, and whatnot, they want to know, if you're involved in that stuff, they want to know what your financial situation because, or your, if, what kind of uh, uh, weaknesses you might have. Let's say you have a, a weakness with the ladies. That can be used by the Russians to, and they, in the Cold War they did this. They exploited a guy's uh, 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 promiscuous behavior and uh, to, to, get, uh, to, to, to bring in an agent to seduce him and then get his information. You know, with pillow talk, next thing you know, the guy's telling everything under the sun. Well, uh, th th this has happened in our history uh, between the United States and Russia in the Cold War, and, 
and previous uh, in history in other nations. So uh, we see that's not that's not nothing unusual where people betray their country for, for money. It goes on even today. Now uh, we have here verse thirteen being fulfilled by Antiochus the third. And uh, remember, verse 15 p resumes the thought of verse 13, as I pointed out. So verse 13 was fulfilled by Antiochus III. Uh, he was also called the Great because of, he had a lot of great military victories. And he, he comes back 14 years after being beat at Raphia by Ptolemy IV Philopater. He comes back 14 years later with a much larger army, and this time he will be successful. And he attacks Egypt when Phil Ptolemy IV Philopater is not in power. His four-year-old son is in power. So as I said before, if you were following me, they had uh, Egypt, Ptolemy IV Philopater had every opportunity to kill Antiochus III and dismantle his army when he had the advantage. But he didn't press his advantage because he was arrogant. He made a terrible move militarily and politically because by not taking out Antiochus III and then letting him rebuild his army and continue to get victories around the Mediterranean, uh, Mesopotamian region, uh, it allowed him to stock up again and then come back and fight again the king of Egypt. So they should have dealt with him when they had the chance, but they didn't do that. Now, it's in verse 14, as we read, uh, the elect angel of God predicts that during those days in which the king of the north will wage war against the king of the south, certain great ones will oppose the king of the south. Even certain violent persons, the angel says, belonging to Daniel's people, the Jews, will for their own benefit rebel in order to fulfill the revelation the angel was communicating to Daniel, which is found in chapters 11 and 12. The angel then tells Daniel that this rebellion will be overthrown by the king of the south. And this too has been fulfilled right to the letter here in history. It was fulfilled because history records that Philip V of Macedonia, he joined with Antiochus III the Great and some politically zealous Jews in, in Israel who were characterized by as being violent people. They all joined together to attack Egypt. So this was all fulfilled in history. History records, though, also that those rebels uh, who were rebelling against the king of Egypt, remember Israel was under their authority at this time, the zealots in the nation who were characterized by violence, they were violent people, they rebelled against the king of Egypt and that rebellion was put down in Israel. The general Scopus, the great general of the Egyptians, Scopus, he came in and he t took out those, uh, those political zealots in Israel who were characterized by violence. He put them to death. He put down that rebellion. So history, again, also records that at this time, politically zealous men in Israel who were characterized by violence waged the rebellion against Egypt who controlled Israel during those days. So a lot of those people in Israel who were zealots, we would call them, and violent people, they wanted to throw their hat in with Antiochus III because they wanted to throw off the yoke of Egypt. Now, this is something interesting. You remember when we studied with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Jeremiah? God said to Jeremiah, submit to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, submit, submit to Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he? Well, in the same way, in this prophecy, God's telling the, the Jews here that this is who these people are going to be under you. So what, basically what these, politi these politically zealous Jews and who were characterized by violence was, were doing is they were fighting against God. God said, you're going to be under the dominion of the Gentiles, guys. And this is the way it's going to be. And so I believe that they were, that one of the manifestations that they were apostasy or unbelievers in Israel is the fact that they, they threw their hat in with, with a despicable guy like Antiochus III to throw off the yoke of Egypt. And they've been doing this, they tried to do this with Rome. God wanted them under Rome. <laughs> they didn't like that, but that's what God wanted. And they kept on fighting God. God kept on saying, his, he says in the, in the book of Daniel, you're going to be, this is the times of the Gentiles. You're under the times of the Gentiles. They had a chance to be throw off the yoke of Rome if they accepted Jesus as Savior in the first advent, but they didn't. And Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Of course, he knew that they were going to reject him. And he could see it in the scriptures. And he also knew it from his omniscient. So it happened. But the Jews have been fighting this about God for, with God for a long time.
So Scopus, uh, this general Scopus for the Egyptians, he overthrew the Jew Jewish rebellion and he punished the ringleaders of this rebellion. And again, God was using this guy to deal with those people in Israel. Now, Daniel 11.15, which we've noted here in, in, uh, this evening, also has been fulfilled in history because history records that in 203 B.C., Antiochus III, the king of the north there, he laid siege to Egypt's fortified city. It was very famous in that day, Sidon, and he captured it. So Antiochus forced the Egyptian general Scopus to surrender near the headwaters of the Jordan River. So what happened is Scopus got trapped by Antiochus' massive army. Remember, in Phil uh, Philip of Macedonia was in, in there, and you had these zealot Jews. Uh, they, of course, they were take, uh, uh, overthrown, but you had Macedonia, and you had the armies of Macedonia under Philip, and you had Antiochus III and his armies, and Egypt, he, they boxed him in, Scopus, and he, gets, he had to go uh, retreat uh, back to Sidon because he didn't have the advantage. He couldn't press the advantage in the, in, in the field. So he had to retreat to Sidon, and he was waiting for help to come from his other three generals who were excellent as well. And it didn't matter. He, he, they, 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 that didn't help him. Uh, those guys were not able to, they were defeated. And Scopus had, was starved out. Basically, he had to surrender the city when he, there was no more food left in the city. Instead of starving to death, they surrendered. And they gave, they gave themselves up to Antiochus III and his army. So, we have, this was, a, this was a great strategic victory for Antiochus III. And it had significance for the Jewish people. Remember, these prophecies are all related to the Jews. You ever wonder why uh, China's not mentioned in prophecy? Uh, something like that. Well, the reason why is God will talk about a nation in relation to Israel. That's when he's going to talk about a nation. And he's, he, he doesn't talk about China in the Bible. Not that he doesn't know about China, obviously. But because China doesn't relate to Israel uh, in its history. And you might have, a, you might have to uh, say with Revelation, with the, the 200 million man army coming across the Euphrates in the uh, tribulation period, you know, you might, I, I think there's good evidence that, that that's China with uh, the other eastern armies. But you really, in the Old Testament, you don't see China because they're not related to Israel in any way. So uh, we have here, this was a great strategic victory for Antiochus III. And I said before, this has implications for Israel. Because that means that no longer will Israel be under the authority of Egypt. Remember, they were a they were vassal state of Egypt. And so Egypt treated them well. If history tells us that the Jews in Egypt, amazingly, they got along pretty well. They were treated well, the Jews, by the Egyptians. But, you know, you see these, these zealot, these bandits, these, uh, these violent men in Israel wanting to throw off the yoke of Egypt. Well, what, they, what they're going to end up having is a, a bunch of tyrants in the Syrian kingdom ruling over them. And Antiochus III, excuse me, he initially, he treated the Jews well. He actually did a lot of good things. He punished those who were pro-Egypt, pro-Egyptian, history tells us. But he, those who were pro-him, you know, that, liked, that wanted to throw their hat in with him, he treated well. Now he put, as we'll see, there's a prophecy about that where he basically treats them well so he could have them in control of the whole nation and have them in his back pocket. So he treated them well so he could control them. Now, that's, this is going to be significant because initially it looks like this is a good deal for Israel. But there's a guy who follows Antiochus III, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he is the one who's spoken about in verses 21 through 35, who's prophesied in Daniel chapter 8 as the small horn, the little horn in chapter 8, who comes from the Greek empire. And he is going to, he's going to persecute and murder uh, Jews. He's going to stop the sacrifices in the temple. He will put to death Jews who are trying to observe the Sabbath and circumcision, and he will burn the Old Testament scriptures. He will kill people who have possession of them, a copy of the scriptures. And so Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he is the next guy in line here. So when he comes to power, it's bad news for Israel. And verses 21 through 35 are all about this man. Uh, the prophecy is all about him and what he did in relation to God and the Jewish people. Because you know, don't forget this. He attacked God by attacking the, uh, the worship of Yahweh in the temple and stopping it. He was going against God. And that's bad news. 
He eventually died insane, as we, as we pointed out in the past. So, Scopus, uh, we see, the, excuse me, the, uh, Scopus is defeated, of course, as we just pointed out, by Antiochus III. It was a great strategic victory for Antiochus III, and it also put Israel under control of the Seleucid kingdom, or the Syrian kingdom, the, the kingdom of the north. And this was the case all the way up until the Roman Empire. See, what's happening around this, what's happening around this time is Rome is is facing Hannibal and Carthage, and they're putting them away with the Punic Wars. While this is going, Rome is being is building up in fulfillment of prophecy. They're going to be the next worldwide empire after Greece. And what's happening around this time with uh, Antiochus the Third, and then with his uh, his his, uh, his uh, the one who follows him, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. What happens is Rome is becoming more powerful. When we get further into this prophecy, there's a prophecy about the Romans, ships of Kittim, and they, they prevent Antiochus Epiphanes IV from going again at Egypt. And uh, they didn't like that. They, they were, they, they, and there's a great uh, story, I won't tell you it right now, I mentioned it in the past, but um, what the Romans did in relation to Antiochus. And uh, in fact, we're going to see it with Antiochus III, Remember, Antiochus Epiphanes IV was actually the son of Antiochus III. When the Romans came in, uh, uh, the Romans uh, put a stop to Antiochus III. Antiochus III ends up getting killed by his own people because he plunders. So he, ends, he had a great military career, but he ends badly. His, because he was trying to plunder the, his own temples because he, didn't have, he needed money to pay tribute to the Romans. And the Romans, when they def- stopped him... They, demand, they took away his army, a bulk of his army, and they basically demanded tribute from him, and he didn't have them all the money to pay, that they asked for. So what he did is he started pillaging his own temples in his own town, and they killed him. And then what happened is Antiochus Epiphanes IV, his son, was taken as a hostage to Rome. And so he was friendly with Rome for a while. And then when he came back, he took power, and uh, in, over, the, over the Syrian kingdom. And what happened was, uh, he thought he could take Egypt, and he, did, he, he misjudged it, the Romans. He thought the Romans would be friendly to him about this, and they didn't want him to do it. They didn't want him to have possession of Egypt. They wanted Egypt for themselves, is what it, what it was. They wanted the, the, for the, the, uh, the wheat, the, the grain, to fit, feed their people. Uh, Rome used to use, take those ships of, from Egypt with grain, and they, they'd come into Rome, feed the Romans, the Roman Empire. So they wanted Rome because of its, the breadbasket, really, of the ancient world there at that time. So this is all this stuff going on. Rome became, was becoming, it was stirring up here. Rome was getting very powerful at this time. And eventually, uh, we see that uh, with Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he goes and tries to attack Egypt again. Romans come in with sh- they're called the ships of Kittim in the chapter. And in ba- basically, a delegation from the Romans said, look it, uh, we don't want you to do this. And he said, well, let me think about it. And so the, uh, the Roman uh, general, uh, he, uh, the Roman, uh, de- one of the Roman delegates, he goes and he takes a, st- a stick and he draws a circle around the Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he, said, he draws a circle on him and he says, okay, he says, I want you to make a decision when you step out of that circle, before you step out of that circle. Because <laughs> if you don't, you step out of the circle without making a decision now, we're attacking you. So he wasn't going to take on Rome at this point. He, he retreated and that was bad for Israel because now he's so mad that he got humiliated by the Roman delegation. He comes back and then he's just so angry and he takes out his frustrations against the Jews and, he, and he, was, he was so upset with the Jews because the Jews were so stubborn. Most of the world was Hellenized at that point. But they were, the Jews were stubborn about this. They wouldn't go into the worship of Zeus, the god of Greece. They, would, they were sticking to their guns and they would not uh, uh, compromise. And they were, they, were, uh, they were halting his Hellenization of the Middle East. So he was frustrated with the Jews and he said, you know what, I'm, I've had enough of these people. And he murdered and he butchered them for several years. For several years. And so uh, this is the story we have here. At this point, Antiochus, is, uh, Antiochus III is at the top of his game here with this great victory uh, over Scopus and the other uh, three great uh, Egyptian generals. So we have here uh, this great strategic victory for Antiochus III is prophesied here in verse 15. It's been fulfilled in history with his great victory over Egypt. 
And this made the Seleucid kingdom the dominant power until the Roman Empire came and became the next superpower. Scopus, the Egyptian general, was appointed to the top command of the army, which is the, uh, and, uh, uh, and it was in this place that, uh, in Cole, Syria, that it was this place that he uh, took a stand against Antiochus III the Great. At first, Scopus was completely successful because he had, in fact, reduced the whole province of Judea into subjection to Ptolemy the Fourth Epiphanes. Remember, he put down the rebellion of those Jews who were characterized by violence. However, soon after this, he was defeated by Antiochus the Third at the Battle of Panium, and we see that Scopus had to shut himself up within the walls of Sidon. And Egypt still had their best generals out there, but they could not set Scopus free. And the army was the, the, these other armies of the three generals were defeated. And Scopus, of course, their greatest general was uh, starved out of this city. Uh, he was ultimately compelled uh, by famine to surrender. And this is documented. You say, well, how do you know this in history? There's a whole bunch of historians that talk about this in the ancient world. Polybius mentions this. Josephus in Antiquities mentions this. And also one of the great uh, Bible scholars of the, uh, the church's history, who was actually from the Catholic Church, Jerome, uh, he, did the, he was quite a scholar. He mentions this as well. So we have this verse 15 has been fulfilled in history. So we know what the text, the verse says, we know what the interpretation is, and of course the application is, is that God is talking to all people, uh, including us today, to have faith in him, trust in him, he's sovereign, we should worship him. We should be like Daniel and worship God. And uh, in our prayers, let's give you an example of what I mean by that uh, passage in Daniel chapter 2, please. Look at Daniel chapter 2. You can look in my translation. Look at verse 19. So God is, with this, this prophecy being fulfilled in verse 15, along with the other verses that we've mentioned in verses 2 through 14, it demonstrates God's sovereign, that he is omnipotent and he's omniscient. And what should that mean to us? I'm going to trust in him. God wants us to trust in him. He wants to turn, turn to his word to solve our problems. Again, if God can govern the world and run the world with his word, can he run on govern our own lives, our personal lives here? I mean, if God's word is responsible for kings rising and falling and nations rising and falling, I think his word can handle our problems in our life, regardless of what those problems may be. Nothing is too uh, it's tough for God if we'd only give him a chance and have faith in him. So God is telling the people of the ancient world, forget about your stupid idols that are inanimate objects. Worship me. I'm a, I'm, I am a God who thinks, makes decisions. In fact, whatever I say goes. I'm sovereign. I'm omnipotent. I can bring to pass things that take place. I can predict things taking place centuries before they happen, and they take place. That's power. I'm omniscient as a result, too. That shows, me, uh, shows I'm omniscient as well. I have all knowledge of these things. There's nobody like me who can compare with me. We saw that in saw, uh, Isaiah chapter 40. We saw this in Isaiah chapter 46. The prophet Isaiah, uh, who lived a couple, of, uh, a couple of centuries before Daniel, he mentions this about God. So this should have, the application is critical. As I've been trying to point out, prophecy, the fulfilled prophecy, is, has great implications for us in our walk with God. It's going to help us in our walk with God because it's going to prompt us to have faith in God's word. And we should be ultimately worshiping God. We should be ultimately worshiping our God as a result of studying this fulfilled prophecy. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Daniel did this. Remember Daniel, when he was, uh, uh, he was uh, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, remember the story? Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he, came, uh, he had a dream. God gave him the dream, you know, the statue, and uh, basically talking about the times of the Gentiles, and in the millennial reign of Christ, the second advent of Christ, None of his wise men could tell him what the dream was. He didn't say, I just want the interpretation. He said, you tell me what I dreamed, and then give me the interpretation. Because he didn't believe in these guys, these wise men. He thought they were a bunch of uh, phonies, and they were. He was a wise king. But what happened was, they said, we can't do it. No king would ever ask his wise men to do this. And he said, well, I'm putting you all to death. And of course, that was bad news for Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they were part of the wise men, and they were going to be executed as well. 
So Daniel finds out about this, and he asks for time from Nebuchadnezzar to, to ask his God about the answer to prayer. He liked Daniel and his three friends. He gave him the time, and he went to prayer, and God, and they had a little prayer meeting, the four of them, and God gave him the content of the dream and the the. Uh, the, uh, the, the interpretation, and now before he uh, tells Neb goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and tell him about this, uh, he has a little prayer of thanksgiving, which is an expression of worshiping God here. And listen to what he says here in, verse, in verses uh, 20 through 23 of Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel 2.19 says, Next in a vision during the night, the mystery of Nebuchadnezzar's dream was revealed to Daniel. Then Daniel, look what it says, He showered the God of the heavens with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. Now look at that. This is what we should learn from Daniel. When Daniel got this revelation from God, he praised God, not only for delivering him and saving him, but giving him a revelation of the Father, uh, the Father giving him a revelation of his will. I mean, we take this for granted many times. We should be praising God, doing exactly what Daniel does for the fact that we're learning all these things in the Bible. Too often I see, and even people who hear the word of God all the time, there's this bit of this arrogance thing where we, we think we're smarter than other Christians or better than other Christians, but if we don't respond to it properly in faith and praise of God and worship of God and instead become arrogant and think we're smarter than other Christians or better than other Christians, we don't get it. We need to respond to it a certain way, and one of the ways is, Worshipful thanksgiving, praising God for, for showing his will to us. We know the future. I mean, you, we, look at the, we, we forget to think about this, but there are people who read horoscopes. They're dying to know what the future says. We know what the future says in our Bibles. We know it. And the world's wondering, what's the future of planet Earth? And the United Nations is our last great hope. And, you know, the Messiah, the president, he'll be, our next president will be the Messiah and save our country. And, oh, you know, we, we live in a fantasy land. Only one person can save us, Jesus. Only one person can give us peace, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Only one is the Messiah. Now, what, what do we learn from Daniel? What he says, he says here in verse 19, then Daniel showered. You know what that means? I love you, 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 I love you. Thank you, Lord. He just showers him with praise. He can't stop talking to him about it. It's like when, it's like when uh, you know, Titus, when he, he has a, a nice meal, and he, he just showers Jody with praise. Thank you, Jody. It's the greatest meal I've ever had in my life. And he's, you know, he's crying. He's like, I can't thank you, God. I mean, showering her. I'm having a little fun. Showering her with praise. That's what, that's what God wants us to do for him. So... Hope you don't mind. I just have a little fun there at your expense. Sorry. Then Daniel showered the God of the heavens with adoring praise, honor, adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. I mean, do we have adoring? Ask this. It's a, it's a rhetorical question that only we can answer for ourselves. I have to answer for myself. Adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll have a show a little, uh, what's the word for it? vulnerability a little. I'll let you in on a thing. I don't do this enough. I should. I, I'm not saying I never do, but I, I don't do it more than, I don't do it more than I should. I, I should do it a lot more. I've done it and do it, but not the way I should. So adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. Daniel responded and said, God, look what he says about God. God has had his name showered with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving from eternity past. And in addition, this will continue throughout eternity future because he inherently is wisdom as well as power. How do we fulfill prophecy demonstrates that? He is inherently wisdom as well as power. Fulfill prophecy proves that. Namely, he determines the appointed times as well as the durations of time. When something will begin and end, and when the, and and how and as a result, how long these things will extend to, we're seeing that with fulfilled prophecy that we're studying in Daniel chapter eleven. He deposes kings as well as elevates kings. How many kings have we talked about in Daniel chapter eleven? In fact, in the book of Daniel, quite a bit. 
God's responsible for deposing kings, that's getting them out of power, as well as elevating kings. He gives wisdom to wise men, as well as knowledge to those who have possessed the capacity to receive understanding. So he's giving us wisdom here, guys, about the future. We, look at well, if we know this, though it's about Israel in the past, and we're going to look at, we study stuff about the tribulation period, Daniel 70th week, we know the divine outline for God's history, for history, what God has planned for this earth. We know the ultimate objective. We know what's going to happen. God wants to establish his son, his kingdom on the earth bodily in Jerusalem for a thousand years as head of the nations and the, his bride with Christ there in Jerusalem. That's us. That's the plan. He has a plan, and it's mapped out for us, and we know what it is. That's wisdom. And that means, how do we orient our lives to that? I'll tell you one thing. It tells me I can't live in, I can't live in habitual sin. I need to keep short accounts with God. I can't just do any old thing I want to do. I should be dedicated and devoted to God. I should love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbors, myself, just as he says to do. I just need to obey God. That's the implication for me. It, it, it's telling me i got to do something. It has, it has implications for me as a Christian in walking in this earth. If all these things are to be the case, I should be as part of the kingdom through faith in Jesus. I should be living accordingly to the precepts of the kingdom, which we've been studying on Sunday with uh, Paul's epistle to Titus. And there's a certain code of conduct, a spiritual code of conduct that God wants us to live in, or live according to. And when we get to verse, what, 14 and 15 of Daniel, uh, Titus chapter 2, I mean, he brings in the rapture and everything. He brings, uh, you know, and how it has implications for us. With the, the imminency of the rapture, it should cause us to live as if he could come back at any moment because we're going to have to give an account for it to him. But some Christians live as if they're not going to give an account to him. And one of the reasons why is they don't believe in fulfilled prophecy or they don't bother studying it. Or if they study it, they don't know, how to, they don't know the implications. They're not applying it. Instead, they get big-headed about it and they think they're smart. When in reality, they're showing how stupid they are because it should affect the way they live their lives now in time. Daniel goes, Daniel goes on to say in verse 22, God reveals unfathomable events. Yes, events which are hidden, hidden to human beings and angels. He alone knows what's in the darkness that speaks of the future. Specifically, the light, the future, look what it says, resides in him. The future is... It's all in God. God is, <laughs> God is immense. We can't measure God. He's, what do they call it? He's the immensity of God. Uh, he's unfathomable. But they, what's the other word that they, 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 we use to describe God? God is, you can't measure God. You can't measure this. God is, you can't, God has no a size that we could measure. He, it, it, so he's saying that the future, the light, specifically the light resides in him. Now look what he says. God reveals unfathomable events. What do we think? We're learning stuff that was given to Daniel in the 6th century BC and all these things we've seen all the way up to Antiochus III have been fulfilled in history. Everything was told to him by the angel up to verse 15 we've seen has been fulfilled in history. Unfathomable events. No wonder Daniel was shook up after this, this revelation. Then look at it says in verse 23. For the benefit of you, O God of my fathers, I, this is the, should be our response to what we've been learning. I myself give thanks, yes, and praise to, because you gave me wisdom. Yes, and power to. You know, knowing the future, listen to me, knowing the future from God's word is power. Let me tell you something. Let me show you how I, what I mean by that. We know, as Christians, as the church, that the rapture can happen at any time. We also know that if we were to die tonight, we'd be absent from the body face to face with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8. We know that we have eternal life, and even if someone murdered us or killed us, put to death the body, we know we got the victory. We're going to be raised from the dead. We're going to be absent from the body face to face with the Lord. We're going to be raised from the dead. No longer to die ever again. Knowing that gives one courage in life. You're not afraid of life because what can scare you in life? God has given you the victory over your greatest enemy. Eternal condemnation, sin, and physical death. 
So knowing that is power that other people don't have that are not Christians. Knowing that gives you the courage, the strength, the power to go through anything in life. Why do you think Paul and the apostles, how do you think they got through things? How do you think Jesus got through things in his humanity? He, know, he knew the future. Knowing the future is power. He knew he could rest assured that God was sovereign in control. So it says in verse 23, For the benefit of you, O God of my fathers, I myself give thanks, yes, and praise to, because you gave me wisdom and, po yes, power to. Indeed, now you have made known to me what we requested from you, because you've made known to us the king's secret. And only God could do that, because God gave the king the, the, the revelation to start with. It was revelation from God. So here's a great response that Daniel gives to us, we connected to what the idea we saw last evening, that learning this fulfilled prophecy, the, the application for us is it should cause us to worship God. That, now, I brought you a passage where Daniel worshiped God in regards to getting revelation uh, that we have of the, uh, the, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which is basically a, a prophecy of, a vision of this, the, the, the uh, times of the Gentiles and the, the, the second advent of Christ and the millennial reign. So worship, what did we see last evening with worship? It involves reverence, awe, and wonder of God. Remember, remember we saw with uh, Wiersbe talking about uh, the, the, his definition? He says, worship is the believer's response of all that they, uh, of that, that they are in their mind, emotions, will, and body to what God is, says, and does. Notice he says, response of all that they are and mind, emotions, will, and body to what God is, says, and does. This, is, this response has a mystical side and a subjective, subjective experience and its practical side and objective obedience to God's revealed will. Worship is a loving response. We respond to what we are hearing that's balanced by the fear of the Lord and is a deepening response as the believer comes to know God better. That's Worsby. Worship of the Lord is, involves reverence for God. And what does reverence mean? We saw this last evening. It's a deep attitude of respect and awe for God. That, we should have that. We shouldn't be going, look at this problem and say, big deal. How can you say big deal? There's something wrong with your relationship with God if it's a big deal. How, big deal like a kill us. Man, I tell you what. That shouldn't be the case. Worship involves respect for him, which is to esteem the, esteem the excellence of his person as manifested through his attributes. And this fulfilled prophecy, I've been mentioning those attributes. Also, as we saw, worship involves awe of God. That means we are to possess an overwhelming feeling of reverence and admiration for this fulfilled prophecy that he, he is, the prophecy that he has fulfilled in history already. And then uh, it also involves wonder, which refers to being filled with admiration, amazement, and awe, and, and it reaches right into our hearts, and it shakes us up and enriches our lives. It draws us closer to God. It should reflect in our character. It should cause us to be obedient to him, knowing he's such a wonderful and mighty God who loved us when we were his enemies and sent his son to the cross for us when we were his enemies and then raised us up and seated us with Christ at his right hand when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, as Paul says in, in Ephesians 2. So what a great... Uh, a great thing that we're learning here about fulfilled, with this fulfilled prophecy in Daniel, we're learning some of the great applications that we have uh, for this uh, study of this fulfilled, great fulfilled prophecy and chapters, uh, chapter 11, verses 2 through 35 in the book of Daniel. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us, re uh, rebuke us, reprove us if necessary, instruct us in righteousness, help us to draw closer to you and worship a more intimate and uh, fellowship with you and adoring a praise for you and worshipful thanksgiving to you like your servant Daniel did when you gave him the revelation you gave to Nebuchadnezzar. So, Father, we pray that this class would have brought glory to you as well as built up and edified the body of Christ. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.